here's your coupon. Shall I remember? Thank yes. you. <laughs> I need I a prompt. I get to keep my lanyard, though. <laughs> I do need a prompt. Yeah. You might push the yellow sheet again, too. The... Uh, sign oh, yeah. Then. Yeah. I got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So should we start? Yeah. Oh, I like that. Someone was said, shh, I feel important. <laughs> so welcome to the second day of the Feminist Majority Foundation's National Young Feminist Leadership Conference. <laughs> I'm Galen Burroughs, and I'm the Feminist Majority Foundation's Director of Policy and Research. And I want to get started today, but before I start talking about today, I wanted to say a little bit about yesterday, because yesterday, was amazing, right? This is my first campus conference with the Feminist Majority Foundation, and I was just literally blown away. I was blown away by you guys, your energy, your enthusiasm. It's just clear that young people are an integral part of the feminist movement, and the feminist movement is strong. And I'm so lucky to have met so many of you yesterday at the workshop sessions, at the exhibition hall, and at our feminist meetup last night. Some of you were there. I think that you guys are the guys that were there. Like, the other people who aren't here, they were the ones that went out last night. <laughs> so they're like still asleep. They're missing out. Um, you're inspiring, fierce feminists, and I know that I'm fired up for day two. Today, oh, let me, I forgot to make up my announcements. Sorry, guys. I have announcements about um, the exhibition hall and about the store. Okay, so in your name tags, I don't know if you guys have, have looked at them, but there is on the inside a coupon for 10% off all shirts at the store. Some of you already have shirts. I still take your coupon over there. And in your program, there is a page where the exhibition guide is that says win feminist prizes at the exhibition hall. So if you go to the exhibition hall today and you check off the tables that you went to, you can turn this page in for feminist swag. Okay, so stickers, buttons, all that good stuff. So please visit our exhibitors at the exhibition halls. And I also have one, this is really, this is really a downer guys. I have one announcement also about the bathroom. Um, some people could not find the gender neutral bathroom yesterday. It's, by, it's down the hall where the workshop rooms are, and there's a sign there that says gender neutral bathroom. So if you're looking for the bathroom, that's where it is. Okay? And now that we got through those fun announcements, <laughs> we're going to talk about feminism. <laughs> right? We're going to talk about feminism globally. Right? Because we know that feminism and feminist activism isn't just contained in the U.S. Right? Feminism is a worldwide mega movement for social change. And it's, it's a diverse mega movement, right? So we have independent feminist movements going on in all countries around the world. But they're, they're independent, but they're also interconnected. And we all have a role to play in the global feminist movement. Just this month, the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women met in New York to evaluate progress on the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs. Some of you may know a lot about the MDGs. Some of you, this is your first time hearing about them. But in 2000, 189 nations came together and made a pledge. And they committed to eradicating extreme poverty in order to create the conditions for freedom and equality for people all over the world. And that included the right to live a life of human dignity, free from hunger, oppression, violence, and injustice. And part of that commitment, what developed out of that commitment, were the Millennium Development Goals. And those are eight goals that the international community pledged to achieve by 2015. Those goals are to eradicate poverty and extreme hunger, to achieve universal primary education, to promote gender equality and empower women, to reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, 
ensure environmental sustainability, and to create partnerships, global partnerships for development. Basically, it was an agenda to change the world, and I really can't think of anything more feminist than that. Those eight goals are the focus of today's General Assembly session, which is called the Global Fight for the Millennium Development Goals, Women's Rights at the Center. Our first speaker is going to be Catherine Spiller. Kathy is the Executive Vice President of the Feminist Majority Foundation and the Executive Editor of Ms. Magazine. And you all got a Ms. Magazine in your packets. That's right. Um, Kathy has been a leader in the feminist movement for decades and she has been an organizer and has been a prominent voice. Decades. <laughs> Sorry, I think decades is a good thing. She has been a prominent voice in our community and has been the driving force behind Girls Learn International. Girls Learn International is a program of the Feminist Majority Foundation that connects middle and high school students in the United States with students in partner countries around the world. We select our partner um, schools by uh, going to countries where girls still face a significant uh, barrier to accessing education. A Girls Learn program provides young people with the opportunity to engage in human rights activism here, and we send a delegation of girls every year to the UN Commission on the Status of Women, and Kathy has just returned from that, and she's gonna talk about achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Thank you, Galen. Um, as, uh, Galen explained, there are eight Millennium Development Goals. Um, the third Millennium Development Goal is empowering women and girls um, and gender equality. And I think all of us would agree that, frankly, to achieve any of the Millennium Goals, women and girls have to be empowered. Um, so I'm going to talk about that uh, briefly. Some of our other speakers this morning are going to go into more detail on the environment or um, on um, uh, uh, birth control and access, uh, universal access to reproductive health care. But without question, we can't achieve any of these uh, eight development goals without empowering women and girls. They're absolutely central to reducing extreme poverty and hunger is the empowerment of women and girls. Um, look at the gender gap in employment. In this country, we've about reached uh, parity in women's participation in the paid labor market, uh, in the paid workforce. Uh, women and men are roughly now uh, at parity. But in many developing countries, uh, one-third fewer women than men participate in the paid labor force. And in some countries, the gap is as large as 50 percent. So having access and the right to work and to receive pay is very, very critical to raising family incomes and community incomes. And, and to do that, we've got to break down the barriers of discrimination against women working in the paid labor force. And we have to close the pay gender gap as well. And of course, in this country, we also have a pay gap that has to be closed. And women in this country still are also relegated to only mostly certain kinds of jobs. And so breaking it, barriers in this country and breaking barriers for women worldwide in the paid labor, move, uh, paid labor force is very, very critical. Um, also, and we talked about this yesterday, the Congresswoman Donna Edwards talked about it, women's responsibility for care work, which is largely unpaid, care of children, care of ill and sick family members, care of the elderly, um, also impacts their ability to participate in the paid labor market um, and to pursue paid employment. And so dealing with those issues, um, child care issues, uh, paid family leave issues, uh, very, very critical to women's empowerment in the labor market. Um, and again, uh, most women's work, of course, is unpaid. Uh, and so recognizing that work and compensating that work is also a key part of empowering women and girls and eradicating extreme poverty. Access to universal uh, primary education. It's a no-brainer. And you're going to hear a little bit about uh, that more uh, from Julia Lee, um, who follows me as one of our girls are an international leaders. Let me give you just a couple of numbers. When a girl in the developing world receives seven more years of education, she marries four years later and has two fewer children in her lifetime. For every year of school, 
uh, that a girl gets, she increases her earning power by anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. So keeping girls in school, getting girls in school, and keeping girls in school is vital to women and girls' empowerment. And really, the world has done a, a very good job over the last several years of uh, sending girls to school in roughly, roughly uh, equal percentages as boys. The problem is too many boys and girls around the world are still not uh, even enrolled in primary school. And so illiteracy rates continue to plague uh, much of the developing world. And women represent uh, roughly two-thirds of those who uh, are illiterate. And so uh, even though we're beginning to make some very good headway on access to primary education, when it gets to secondary school and tertiary school, girls begin to drop out in very large numbers. Part of it is a poverty issue. If a family only has very limited resources, they're going to probably invest those resources in the boy child and not the girl child. So eradicating poverty is also part of education, as is education is part of eradicating poverty. But also, as girls uh, uh, advance into puberty, having access to separate sanitation facilities and access to sanitary products as they begin to menstruate, Lack of that access is accounting for a huge drop-off um, as girls um, get ready for secondary school. So we've got to address those issues, which are reproductive health issues um, as well, if girls are going to take advantage of educational opportunities and stay in school. Then when you talk about reducing child mortality and reducing maternal mortality, the two are so interlinked you can hardly talk about one without the other. The most important um, determinant of maternal health is access to reproductive health services, access to modern forms of contraception, and access to safe abortion services. And it's the lack of those two that account for maternal mortality rates all over the world, which have been reduced significantly since the UN adopted the Millennium Development Goals, but is still too high. Some 47,000 women die every year of uh, botched, uh, unsafe abortions. Uh, some uh, 200,000, uh, 287,000, I think, is the number of women die of uh, causes related to pregnancy, causes that are completely preventable if they have access to contraception to prevent unwanted pregnancy and if they have access to uh, prenatal care and to skilled birthing attendants very, very critical to reducing these rates of maternal mortality. And the U.S. foreign policy has a big role in this to play. We are not meeting our international responsibilities and providing funding for contraception and family planning. And many of our policies and laws are increasing the rates of unsafe abortion and deaths from botched abortions. We've got to dramatically increase the U.S. participation in family planning funding uh, and get rid of these horrible abstinence-only and other restrictive policies that keep women from having access to safe abortion and to family planning. <laughs> HIV AIDS, leading cause of death for girls in their uh, reproductive uh, years. Uh, access to safe drinking water, sustainable environment. If girls didn't have to spend so much time hauling water every day, they might be able to stay in school. Very critical. And sustainable development. Without women and girls participating in the paid economy, having access to loans, having access to business opportunities, uh, we're never going to have a world where we can have sustainable development as we reduce poverty. Let me say a couple of things um, that we've got to be concerned about, especially as citizens of the United States. There are a couple of major things that we should stay focused on. One is political empowerment of women in this country, because if we had more women in Congress and more women in the administration and decision making, we could begin to address these issues for our sisters around the world. It is very critical that we think about our own political empowerment so that we can make a difference, not only for women here, but for women and girls all over the world. But something else that we can all do, for those of us who stay tomorrow for our lobby day, but even those who can't and you're returning home, the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, 
the acronym is CEDAW, C-E-D-A-W, and you have a wonderful fact sheet in your kit. I urge you to read it and to become familiar with the contents uh, and, the, and the components of this treaty. We're calling it the Women's Treaty. Um, and um, the United States, you must understand, is one of only seven countries in the world that has not ratified this United Nations Treaty. The treaty has been around for 40 years. President Carter first signed the treaty, but the United States Senate that must ratify the treaty by a two-thirds vote has not even scheduled it for a vote on the floor of the U.S. Senate, 40 years later. Who are the other six countries that haven't ratified CEDAW? Iran, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, and two little islands in the South Pacific, uh, Tonga and Palau, and the United States. Very quickly, the treaty defines what equality would be and sets a goal for all nations to strive for to achieve full equality for women and girls. It talks about what is discrimination. It defines it so that nobody has to say, well, I didn't know that that was discrimination when you know, women don't have equal access to the paid workforce. Um, so it defines discrimination and it says what we can do to eliminate discriminatory laws in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the social sphere, and in culture. So it talks about equality in public office, equality in education, equality in employment, and in healthcare, and access to healthcare services. And it does something very critical. It, it requires countries to report on a regular basis to the UN Committee on their progress towards achieving the goals. So it sort of sets up a process in each country where you look at yourself, you look at where women and girls are, you look at what laws are discriminatory, what must be done to eliminate those discriminatory practices and laws, and you got to report on it. And if the committee, made up of participating countries that have ratified the treaty, don't think you're doing enough, they can call you back every year. They can question why you haven't done more. Well, the United States, one, isn't even looking at itself, and two, we're not part of the dialogue globally. So we can't question why Saudi Arabia has yet to fully enfranchise half of its population. And we can't question why in Pakistan girls are still denied access to education in so many areas. We're not part of the discussion. And so every time Hillary Clinton would travel around the world as Secretary of State and raise those questions, they would look at her and say, but you haven't even ratified CEDAW. We can do something about it. Who here is from New Jersey? All right. Senator Menendez is chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He must schedule hearings on CEDAW this year. We want hearings this summer. So those of you who are staying should go meet with his staff tomorrow, and those of you who are returning home should go meet with his office in New Jersey. Already we've got high school students and uh, college students and adult advocates who are scheduling meetings in New Jersey. Join them. Who here is from Tennessee? You were here yesterday. You, you got voted to be here this morning, the one person to represent Tennessee. All right, Tennessee's important. Senator Corker is the ranking minority member on Senate Foreign Relations. He's got to know that the women of Tennessee want him to vote for ratifying CEDAW. And all of you who are from states like California, Arizona, anyone here from Arizona? Here. Yes, all right. Senator John McCain, 40 years, uh, sorry, 20 years ago, 20 years ago signed a letter to then President Clinton saying, I am for CEDAW. You're going to hold him to it. And we'll give you a copy of the letter if you need it. And you march into that office and you ask what he'll do when it comes to the floor of the Senate later this year. It's some of the most important work we can do is to demand equality for women here so that equality for women and girls can happen all over the world. Now I want to introduce a very, very important uh, leader 
and the newest generation taking their place at the table. Uh, in our Girls Learn International program, Julia Lee is a leader from Trinity School in New York City. She's going to tell you about this incredible program. We want you to think about your younger brothers and sisters. They could start a program in their high school, or you could go out to high schools near a college and help us start programs there. Julia Lee. Um, when I joined Girls Learn International, one of the first activities I participated in was something called the impossible budget. So here's how it works. You split up the room into small groups and give each group a situation card that describes their family makeup, their living situation, and their daily income, as well as a list of potential family expenses that are divided into categories such as food, water, heat, health care, and education. And together, each group has to decide how best to spend the daily income to meet the family's needs. You might earn a dollar a day and have two children and a sick mother to care for. You'll choose between medicine for the mother or your youngest child. You'll choose between clean drinking water and an extra meal. You'll choose between an education for your male child or for your female child. This was the activity that revolutionized the way I thought about the world, the activity that became my mission statement. Because after just 10 minutes, a powerful wave of shared grief and resolve passes through the room, cementing a silent agreement between all that this is wrong. The game is wrong. You cannot win. None of your choices matter. And the idea of choosing is a violation of human rights. This is. This is the activity that forced me to realize that the system is broken, and the only way to fix that system is to take feminism as a whole, to refuse to play the games of pitting human right against human right. The only way for all of us to win is to embrace intersectionality. GLI, like the FMF, is intersectional, and of course, intersectionality has its limitations because um, we can't cover every intersection of oppressive norms and often because we just don't have the time and then certain groups will walk away disgruntled. But GLI's intersectionality to me means that at, at every moment all of me is embraced. I identify as genderqueer and asexual and it's at a... <laughs> It's, it's at a meeting of GLI's student board where I first publicly came out because I felt truly accepted for the first time in my life. But intersectionality is not just about the issues that personally affect me, and I am reminded of that through regular communication with a partner school in Kenya. My chapter exchanged letters with girls who were walking eight hours a day to fetch water instead of learning in school. We resolved to raise funds to build them a well. Through our partner schools, GLI students learn how to advocate not only for ourselves, but for others. We learn that intersectionality is not about who's ignoring me, but about who am I ignoring. And that's why GLI's curriculum is about human rights, not constitutional rights. Because constitutional rights are based on human rights, but when we don't talk about that link, we risk sending the message that it's okay to only care about the rights of Americans. We need to learn about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because we owe allegiance to every single human being. We don't have inalienable rights because of our founding fathers, but because of our ordinary human mothers. I believe Terry O'Neill said yesterday that we're, that we're winning the war of ideas, but not of policy. When I became part of GLI and started leading meetings and advocating at my school, I learned exactly where that demarcation lies. Everyone will agree that women and girls deserve equal rights, but for some reason they're not really interested in signing the CEDAW peti petition, which literally says exactly what they just profess to believe. Um, we're even winning the war of ideas in the media. Um, everyone is passionate about sexualization and perpetuation of gender stereotypes and being the watchdogs of internet sites. And this is wonderful. But when you start talking about legislative policy, their eyes just glaze over and they stop listening. I've discovered that many of my friends would even rather disagree with statistics published by the Department of Labor than, um, than face the reality and responsibility of involvement in the war of policy. But GLI is different, and it's led by students who are action-oriented. 
Some GLI students have organized a campaign in support of CEDAW, and in May they're going to meet with Senator Menendez. Another girl has drafted a bill on human trafficking, which she is working to bring to the New Jersey legislature. Each year, GLI sends a delegation to the Commission on the Status of Women at the UN, and they are so well informed that they lead the training for all youth delegates at the CSW. They also sit on panels, moderate panels, and discuss the work that they are passionate about. This year, there was a panel on girls' political empowerment, and girls like Danya, who I think is here, yeah, she's awesome. Um, talked about how they're getting themselves elected and working to change who's at the decision-making table. GLI students are dedicated to changing policy because we know that changing the culture will not change the laws that govern justice for girls. This system of oppression has been carefully constructed by those in power to maintain their power, and they won't give it up unless we stop being suckers. <laughs> That means recognizing that although the effects of oppression on diverse groups are multiple, the system of oppression is one. We have to know who the enemy is and attack there. So let's not use the hashtag solidarities for white women because it blames women and divides us, making our enemy stronger. Instead, let's say something like, like the hashtag solidarity is for me too, to remind each other that all of our diverse experiences need to be expressed not as disparate voices, but as part of our solidarity with each other as victims of the oppression of women and girls and everyone who doesn't fit that binary. We young people have a reputation for being the me, me, me generation, and that's wrong. But instead of being angry, let's prove our doubters wrong by listening, by healing our relationship with those members of that generation who have been our champions and our mentors. And on that note, look, I know that Gloria Steinem refuses to give up her torch because we all as young activists have to find our own way. I hope Ellie Smeal and Kathy Spill will never give up theirs either. We are all capable of carrying our own torches and need to remember that any leader who operates without dialogue is an oppressor too. Let's just all make sure we're heading in the same direction or we'll burn the whole house down. <laughs> your liberation is bound up with mine and mine with yours. Now you're gonna hear from some other GLI chapters. Um, I'd like to welcome them up to the stage to share the work that they're doing. Thank you. My name is Emma Halley and I'm part of the Alice Paul Institute in New Jersey. Our chapter is part of the Girls Advisory Council at the Alice Paul Institute and we have members from 13 different high schools. We just finished presenting the, at the Alice Paul Equality Awards where we honored six women who share the same goals as Alice Paul. We also visited the Clara Barton Schoolhouse in Bordentown, New Jersey where we learned how Clara Barton dedicated her entire life to equal education for boys and girls. Hi, um, my name is Carrie Duganzik, and I'm also from New Jersey with our Cranford High School chapter. <laughs> One other girl is here, um, but we're strong. Uh, this year, our chapter focused on women and girls in the media, and we watched commercials, analyzed magazine ads, and discussed the objectification of women in our society, because we know that the portrayal of women in the media affects how society sees powerful women, and we know that we take back the media by showing positive portrayals of women and girls. Hi, my name is Leah Greenhouse, and I'm from the Montclair High School chapter in New Jersey. <laughs> this year, our chapter doubled in size and hosted some successful events, including a Human Rights Day panel of local activists and a huge screening of the movie Girl Rising, in which we raised over $800 for our partner school in Kenya. Hello, my name is Allie Kay, and I'm from the GLI chapter in Oakton High School, Virginia. <laughs> uh, this year, we actually started our GLI chapter, so we have been focusing on educating our school about the lack of girls' education around the world. We've uh, had movie screenings of Graceland Girls, uh, a few parts of Girl Rising, and a CNN documentary on Malala Yousavi. 
Uh, right now, we are working on our student advocacy event for a school-wide talent show for people to show what they've learned through education, whether it be music classes, dance classes, or things they've taught themselves. We're really excited to keep on doing it. My name is Anika Rahman, and I'm from the Trinity School in New York City. <laughs> We have hosted numerous Lunch and Learn events for the upper school community in which we have screened films such as Girl Rising and Makers and hosted guests such as Spark and Girls for Gender Equality. We have written pen pal letters and created a mural that we sent to our partner school, Tembea Girls High School in Kenya. And earlier this month, we hosted a film screening of Selling of Innocence with Rashira Gupta. So I don't think any of us have to worry about uh, the high school generation. And we want you to work with them and them with you. So help us meet them before you leave today. These girls are tearing it up. And I, want to, I just want to let you know that on your yellow sheet in your packet, your group can pledge to mentor a GLI chapter. But then after hearing that, I was like, I need a GLI student to mentor me. <laughs> they are fierce. Let's give them another round of applause. You guys can also uh, join the GLI uh, program in advocating for CEDA. Um, they're at, outside at the Action Center, I think it says, speak like a feminist or state like a feminist. <laughs> you can uh, sign, um, assign an action sheet on CEDA. You can also take a pledge for your group to support CEDA in your packets on the yellow activism pledge. And get Ms. You hear that? <laughs> so, right. Now I'm going to invite um, our second wave of panelists up to the stage, if you guys can come on up. I think you have your name cards over there. Here, sit here. Okay. Sorry, small set change. Okay, so we're going to continue right along, and I think that one of the things that we've been talking about is eradicating poverty and eradicating poverty through education. But we can also eradicate poverty through um, fair labor practices, right, and making sure that people earn a decent wage, a wage that allows them to live a life of dignity. And so today we have Liana Foxbog here, and Liana is the Director of Organizing and Communications for the International Labor Rights Forum, where she coordinates campaigns for workers' rights in the global apparel industry, which is known, well known, for exploitation of people for cheap labor and its perpetuation of violence against women at work. The apparel industry's outrageous practices have led to several recent tragedies, including the Rana Plaza building collapse that killed over a thousand people in Bangladesh. And I think that Liana is going to talk to us a little bit about that. So, Liana. Thank you, Galen. Good morning, everyone. At International Labor Rights Forum, we take action in support of low-wage workers around the world who make the products that we consume here in the US. And we lift up their voices and struggles through research, policy work, media work, and mobilizing activism. And like Galen said, my focus is on the garment industry. 80% um, of the people working in the garment industry are women. Forced over time, verbal abuse, sexual harassment on the job are common. Forced pregnancy testing used to be a prerequisite to get the job in many factories. Luckily, at least that has changed in many places due to women workers organizing. Women in the global garment industry receive poverty wages. Rather than serving as a pathway out of poverty, the industry keeps workers and their families in poverty. By starting work at young ages, teenagers lose out on educational opportunities, and as they're considered disposable by the industry, 10 years later, they have few work opportunities once they're discarded by the industry due to repetitive stress injuries and back pain when they can no longer work as fast. I learned how to use a sewing machine when I was nine years old. And from experience, I know that apart from the occasional pinprick, it's actually pretty safe work. At least it should be. But the industry that makes the clothes that you and I wear isn't safe at all. 
The past year and a half has been marked by a series of horrific disasters due to lethally negligent corporate practices. In September 2012, a fire at Ali Enterprises factory in Pakistan took the lives of 259 garment workers who were trapped inside because there weren't enough exits. Then, two months later, 112 workers were killed at a fire at Tazreen Fashions in Bangladesh, locked inside by floor managers who first thought it was a false alarm or a fire drill, and they couldn't bear to lose precious minutes of work time due to the tight turnaround times impo imposed upon them by multinational corporations. Then the deadliest incident in the history of the global garment industry took place. On April 24th last year, Rana Plaza, a building in Bangladesh that housed five garment factories, collapsed, killing at least 1,138 workers and injuring many more. U.S. companies know about the unsafe working conditions in the industry. In fact, their own auditors find problems time and again, but all too often turn a blind eye to the problems, or even worse, they walk quietly away from the factories. But these working women are left behind in the death trap factory they're just producing now for other companies. None of the U.S. brands that have agreed to pay even a penny of compensation to the victims of the Tazreen fire. This week, on Wednesday, in an effort to deflect public pressure, Walmart and Children's Place finally paid in a small amount to the Rana Plaza victims of the incident 11 months ago. But that is far short of what they owe. Children's Place paid less than $200 per family. Walmart paid less than $500 per family. And meanwhile, the victims are continuing to suffer, struggling to cope with the pain and psychological and emotional trauma of the disaster and the tremendous added financial burdens that they now face from hospital bills or from losing their own, the family's only income earner. But I'm here to say that there is hope. And it comes down to all of us taking action. Our coalition generated over a million petition signatures to Gap, H&M, and Walmart, and more than 200 store delegations and 50 store actions nationwide in the past year. And these actions linked up with actions in other countries. As a result, 150 companies have now signed on to an unprecedented legally binding agreement with two global unions and 10 Bangladeshi unions to prevent future tragedies in the Bangladesh garment industry. And it's called the Accord on Fire and Building Safety. On your campus, I encourage you to link up with United Students Against Sweatshops, which is calling on universities to require the brands that do business with universities and make university logo clothing to sign on to the accord. Already, 11 major universities have required this of their licensee brands, and it's making a huge difference in getting more companies to join the accord. And USAS is on about 150 campuses around the country, so you can check them out on usas.org to see if they're near you. Um, USAS is bringing a survivor of the Rana Plaza collapse to campuses starting next week to call on VF Corporation, which is a huge company that owns North Face and 25 other brands to sign on to the accord. And you can check out northfacedeathtraps.com to see if the tour is coming to your community. Right now, we're gearing up for April 24th, the one-year anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. It's going to be a global day of action, and demonstrations will take place at Walmart and Children's Place stores around the country in the U.S., calling on the companies to pay full and fair compensation to the victims. In a little bit, I'll send around our petition that we have to Children's Place. 
as well as information about the Global Day of Action and also details for the demonstration here in DC, if you're here nearby. And my email address is on the flyers, so feel free to follow up with me if you want to organize a demonstration in your community or come talk to me afterwards. And just as a last point for those of you also here in DC is we're bringing together women trade union leaders from Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Honduras on April 29th for a conference on women's rights in the apparel industry. So you can get more info on that also from our website, laborrights.org, or follow up with my info on the flyer. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, you can read more about uh, the garment industry and about the tragedies in Bangladesh in Ms. Magazine. Um, and you can also pick up the petition um, at the Action Center outside. And you can also um, fill out your pledge to end sweatshops on your yellow activism pledge form that's in your packet. So thank you, Liana. We're going to move now back to education and a, a means of eradicating poverty around the world. And our next speaker is going to be Fatima Syed. Fatima is a global research specialist at the Feminist Majority Foundation, where she focuses her work on our campaign um, for Afghan women and girls. An Afghan herself, Fatima recently traveled to Afghanistan and to the Swat Valley in Pakistan, where she connected schools there with our Girls Learn program. And you can see that that is amazing. Um, she also met with civil society leaders while she was in Afghanistan and was able to witness the tremendous amounts of progress that have been made in Afghanistan over the past decade, both in terms of economic development, women's rights, and women's per political participation. Fatima. Good morning, everyone. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela once said. According to the UN Millennium Development Goal, Enrollment in primary education development countries has reached to 90% in 2010, up from 82% in 1999, which means more kids than ever are attending primary school. That's a good news, but unfortunately, there are some countries like Afghanistan where children are still struggling to have access to basic education. The importance of education for any nation cannot be overstressed, especially in a country where children were deprived from basic education for almost a decade. During the Taliban, almost all the schools were closed down and children, especially girls, were not allowed to go to school. After the defeat of Taliban, girls, girls were able to openly go to school. Right now, more than 8 million students are enrolled in school, and almost 40% of them are females. There are 96 universities now operating in Afghanistan, educating more than 200,000 students. Currently, some 20% of these Afghan college students are female. Even now, despite the fact that a huge number of girls are attending schools, but there are some areas in Afghanistan where children and students are facing threats from the Taliban on a daily basis. And some of them have been at attacked and their teachers have been killed. But Afghan girls and women are determined to continue their education and will not give up their education. Last year when I visited Afghanistan and Pakistan for our Girls Learn International program, I visited many schools and met many students, including Malala and Swat Valley of Pakistan. Remember Malala, I hope? <laughs> I'm sure you know, she's a 16 years old, uh, very strong uh, student uh, who was shot in the head by the Taliban gunman on her way home from school. I'm happy to announce that her school today is partnered with our three GLI program chapter school here in the United States. <laughs> to see Swat, girl, Swat Valley girls walking to school, 
delighted to be learning and spending time together in the classroom give me hope for the future. When I met them and I saw their courage, I was amazed because I thought every one of them were Malalas. Because if, if the Taliban shot one Malala, they could not stop the rest. <laughs> right now, our GLI program has partnered with many schools around the world. We have five partner schools in Afghanistan and 12 in Pakistan. One of the Afghan girls shared her experience with me about how she felt when she first time attended school after the defeat of the Taliban. There was an overwhelming sense of freedom, she said. Wearing a school uniform was a great liberation and source of pride. Everyone had a huge desire for a school and there was a hunger for learning and it still is, believe me. Today, Afghan women are in the parliament, judges, lawyers, nurses, and doctors. They are in the military and on the police force. Though the numbers are low, but they are growing. Some Afghan women leaders have been assassinated. Yet, despite the danger, others have immediately stepped up and continued their work for women's rights. Despite significant progress, Afghanistan has a large number of children out of school most of them are girls who are still not in the school. There's a lack of trained teachers. After elementary school, where 40% of the students are girls, the number dropped to 25% when they get into high school. Due to the gender segregated system, we have lack of qualified teachers for girls. So the family does not allow their their girls to attend the school when there's male teachers t teaching them because of the culture barriers. Plus some girls drop out due to the lack of sanitary products. I'm sure you'll be shocked by hearing this because this is one of the barriers for girls that you know when they get to puberty they don't have the proper sanitary products to take care of themselves. Others dro drop out because they have to work around the house. In the past 12 years however with the support of the foreign aid and the determination and support of the Afghan people, many Afghan young women have been able to utilize these opportunities and achieve their goals. Right now, we have a vibrant and hopeful Afghan youth population that's ready to embrace their role in the society. For example, in the upcoming Afghan election, which is on April 5th, 70% of the Professional candidates are consisted of young generation in Afghanistan, and 27% of them are female. Today, we have 25% parliamentarian, uh, women parliamentarian in the parliament in Afghanistan. Undoubtedly, Afghan women and girls have made considerable progress in education, healthcare, employment, leadership since the fall of the Taliban. However, they need our help more than ever before. I'm sure you will agree with me that if we want to have sustainable democracy and rule of law in Afghanistan, the United States and the international community should not hesitate and shy away from investing in education and, and should continue their humanitarian aid and development assistance. Afghan women have come a long way to achieve these goals, and I think the fight is not over yet. Although the US and the NATO troops are leaving, we cannot forget Afghan people, especially women and girls. Afghans as well as the US has made huge sacrifices to bring Afghanistan back on its feet. Leaving Afghanistan without any serious and strong commitment could mean for Afghan women and girls going back to the dark ages of Taliban. Afghan women leaders and girls are fighting for their lives and rights. We have all learned from their courage and strength. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with Afghan women and girls. I think, I'm, I'm sure you all agree with me that we need to support them in every way we can. So before uh, I leave the stage, I would like to welcome 
Farnay Nazari. She is the uh, advocacy manager for women for Afghan women. And uh, she recently visited Afghanistan and she's going to speak about her trip. And also I would like to encourage you to please do purchase some Afghan um, crafts, which is outside the, uh, this hall. And also there is an Afghan uh, treasure. Uh, you can buy some very cute stuff. So, so thank you. <laughs> Hello, thank you for giving me a, an opportunity to speak here. Um, I am, um, I was in Afghanistan and um, just 10 days ago I came back. I spent a month there. Um, I'm, I'm from Afghanistan. I grew up there. I lived in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime. Um, and I didn't have any access to education or schooling during that time. Uh, and when, when I was 13 and I had to wear the, the burqa just to step out of the home, um, I stayed at home for three years. And actually I learned English during that time at home with the help of my family members uh, and returned to school after the fall of the Taliban government in, in, in 2001. I remember um, in November when uh, finally, you know, the, the Taliban were gone and uh, it, it happened quickly, um, and I was overjoyed. I stepped out of my home, and I went to, to just see the streets without the barrier of a burqa in front of me. Um, usually in the winters, there is a vacation in Afghanistan, but that year, the schools opened in winter time, and students and teachers went back to school. Th there was a celebration, a joy that the Taliban has fallen, and 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 now I'm going to talk to you about the the progress and the change in the past uh, 13 years, and and also some of the fears. Um, so when I when I went I went to Afghanistan this time um, to see some the work of my organization Women for Afghan Women um, in the field. Um, Women for Afghan Women it was it was founded in 2001 um, and they have now 27 offices in 10 provinces of Afghanistan and they operate children's support centers, halfway houses, transitional houses, uh, permanent in, uh, shelters, um, and they all serve women and children. Um, this was um, what, what I saw there, that thousands of women are being served. Uh, I could not imagine that back in 2001. Nothing like that could have existed. Um, for example, I met with, with our office managers in Kabul and from Badakhshan province. Um, uh, our manager to to said that in the past years when domestic violence um, was really tense for women, it was women just went and drowned themselves in Kokcha River. Um, and that is the way women also burn themselves in Iraq. But those numbers have, have gone down. And she said since they have opened the, the office in Badakhshan in 2008, since then the numbers have gone down. And last year, no woman drowned themselves in the river. <laughs> Now women have an office to go to, they have an address, they have a hotline in Afghanistan, and they can come and they have housing and they have protection. This work needs to continue. It has to continue. And, and the way we have gone forward and see change all these years, my um, colleague Fatma really outlined all the numbers. I actually had those stats here too, but there is no need to repeat them that women have, girls are going back to school, um, that um, now there is, um, you know, 
from the time that there was only about one million children were going to school in, in 2001 and no girls. Now there is eight million and a third of them are girls. That is progress, that's change. Now there are 68 TV private TV channels, 22 state-owned TV channels, and 174 radio channels. In 2001, there was no TV and there was one radio channel. That was it. That has changed, that's progress. <laughs> and, and the challenge now is, and this is, this is thanks to the um, support of the international community that the, the situation for Afghan women is the ground zero. And if we can ch make change there, if women can, can uh, make progress there, we are more hopeful in the world that women can make progress in the world because women there have lived under really challenging circumstances. Um, and this change can continue. We can keep up with this progress only if the, the determination of women will continue. Every woman I talked to there, I said, look, security is you know, tense right now. Um, for example, in our Kunduz province, um, a woman was on, on her way, we were taking her to our shelter. Um, the, uh, the crime was that she had committed adultery and we were taking her to our safe shelter on the way the Taliban had come and, and took her away. And they were starting to, um, to dig the ground. They buried them halfway and then started stoning them to death. Um, and our office immediately called, called the Afghan police, the Afghan national police, and they came, a fought to start it with the Taliban. They took the woman out, brought her safely back to our shelter. And, and thousands of women, there are, there are stories like this. I was just listening, listening to their stories and I was becoming hopeful, more and more hopeful. And the challenge ahead of us right now is the elections um, in, in 5th of April. Um, the Taliban have disrupted it quite a lot. They have tried to, uh, the security incidents have gone up. There have been several explosions, suicide attacks um, all around Afghanistan, some of them very bloody. But despite, despite that, despite all the attempts they are making to disrupt uh, elections, Afghan people are standing up for democracy. They want freedom. And you can see that because of the long lines for registration of cards. Right now, my, my friends are tweeting and putting on Facebook, the long lines, and, and they say, look, I got my card. And this is in, a, in, in one of the uh, registry offices where um, just hours, hours before, for five hours, the area was under attack. And two hours later, after the attack had calmed down, there were hundreds of people behind their, the door wanting to vote. Um, and as, as we move forward in Afghanistan, my, my message to everyone is that if you don't see Afghanistan in the headlines of the newspaper, sometimes the bad news can become really good for the media to go after and make it look 10 times as bad. But there is a lot of good news also in Afghanistan. <laughs> we all look for hope. We look for change, and my message is never to forget Afghanistan. I'm thankful for every organization who have worked for the rights of Afghan women in the past several years, and I hope that that continues. Thank you. Let's get another round of applause for our panelists on the stage right now. So you know what I'm going to tell you? It's about the yellow sheets in the back of your packets. <laughs>
Brain, take out your yellow sheets. You can pledge to support our campaign for Afghan women and girls. You can also today go to the Action Center. I'm sounding like a broken record, but you can go to the Action Center and you yourself can sign a pledge to stand shoulder to shoulder with Afghan women during this time. Um, we are also having a, um, a blog series that is going on right now on our, um, on our website, and it's called Standing Shoulder to Shoulder, and it's a blog series written by um, Afghan women who have lived in Afghanistan or have experienced the Taliban, and it's a before and after sort of blog series to show the progress that has been made in Afghanistan since the fall of the Taliban, and there are many powerful stories in the blog series that are very similar to the, what you've heard today on stage. So I am now welcomed by the last of our panelists, and um, I have some keys here. Um, and if you lost your keys, they were left on the store table. I have them, and we will put them at the registration desk if you, if you are looking for them. So we're now going to turn our attention to environmental sustainability. Today, the world's population stands at over 7 billion people. That's 7 big B billion. And that number is climbing. The more people, the more stress on our environment. The more stress on our environment, the more likely it is that we'll experience a decline in our resources and in our quality of life. And that means poverty, sickness, and more conflict. John Seeger is here to talk to us about the environment, population, and family planning. John is the president and CEO of Population Connection, the largest US grassroots organization focusing on population growth and its impact on environmental sustainability. He's a feminist and an expert on the need to defend our planet while ensuring social justice and human rights. Please welcome John Seeger. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually a fifth generation feminist, but that's a very long story for another day. <laughs> and I'm working on getting that up to seven because I have a four month old granddaughter who hasn't really revealed her political affiliations yet, but uh, uh, since her mother spent her first uh, two years after college, my daughter Katie, working as a uh, uh, Spanish language interpreter at a Planned Parenthood clinic, I think the odds are, are very high. <laughs> you know, wh when we think of, uh, just take a moment and, and form a thought picture if you could, uh, when I say the word environment, bring up a picture in your mind. Uh, how many of you brought up a picture of some uh, idyllic scene, some, uh, you know, how many have brought up a picture of maybe of pollution or, or, or that? Well, how many of you brought up, this is for the people who have no imagination at all. <laughs> how many people brought up a picture of this room? Well, well, this is the environment, isn't it? I mean, this is as much the environment as anything else. The environment isn't out there. It's, it's everywhere. You really can't get away from it. Even if you die, you're not going to get away with it. You're going to play a different role in it. And, the environmental movement in the United States began, oh, I don't know, 150 years ago, and, and it was started by people like Henry David Thoreau and Teddy Roosevelt. We have a term for those people. We call them Fedwigs, famous dead white guys. <laughs> if, if you get downtown, you're going to notice every circle has some. It's either, a, either they're commemorating a lot of famous horses or <laughs> these famous dead white guys on them. I, I don't know which. Uh, but, but that, that era, I think, is uh, changing. Uh, certainly, those, those of you who know a bit of the history of the movement know that one of the great leaders who sounded one of the modern alarms about the environment was Rachel Carson. So, you know, it, it's changing, and it's changing in a lot of other ways. Did you know most of the food that's produced on this earth is produced by women farmers? And, and while certainly women are not by any means the only victims of climate change, uh, those who live in the global south, those who are poor, those who are dispossessed, are the ones who are going to bear the greatest brunt of this terrible science experiment that we're running on the earth right now. There is a tiny island nation in the South Pacific called Kiribati. It's going to disappear. Most of that nation is only six feet above sea level. It's just going to go away. And, and guess what? There's no court on earth that these people can go to. They can't file an injunction to stop all of, 
all of the developed nations on Earth from burning fossil fuels. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has reported that if we stopped every fossil fuel burning engine on Earth today, all of them, the Priuses, the Escalades, the, the coal-fired plants, all of them, everything, the glaciers will continue to melt for thousands of years. That, that's just a fact we have to deal with. Fossil fuel emissions are like tobacco. There is no safe level. There is no acceptable level. I might say that about a lot of things in, in life, but there's no safe level with tobacco. There's no safe level with fossil fuel emissions. In trying to meet the climate challenge, there are, to the best of my knowledge, only three ways we can get there. One is nuclear power, a vast expansion of nuclear power plants, <coughs> Fukushima. Uh, <laughs> the, now, nuclear power is a wonderful thing. As Bill McDonough, a former dean of the UVA School of Architecture, said, it, but it's good to keep it at a safe distance. The sun seems like a good place for it. It's about 93 million miles away. But, but a vast expansion of nuclear power is troubling to many people, myself included. The second possibility, the second solution, and this is a very popular one in life, is magical thinking. <laughs> magical thinking, you know, most of us engage in from time to time, and a little bit of it is good, but I'm not sure it's good as a life plan. And, and yes, we're going to have amazing technological breakthroughs. By the way, I speak at a lot of college campuses, and I point out, or at least I make the assertion, that if you were to list the top five technological innovations of the last 1,000 years, and it's been a, it was a busy millennium, all things considered, I would say that modern contraception is right there in the top five. Because, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but guess what? The choir does all the singing. Uh, the, you know, the, the fact is that for the first time in the history of the world, half the world doesn't have to depend on the other half of the world for the trajectory of their lives. So technology is wonderful. It can be wonderful. It can be great. But just hoping that some technology around the corner, around the next bend is going to solve everything is, is a pretty risky way to, to bet the future of the planet. There is a third possibility to meet the climate challenge, and it is this, and every word in here for me is critical. It's universal awareness of and access to affordable, voluntary, that's the most important word, voluntary contraception coupled with the full empowerment of women. Now, what does that have, yeah, we're all for it, but, what does that have to do with climate change? Here's what it has to do with it. Whenever women are empowered, whenever they have access to contraception, whenever they're able to decide the trajectory of their own lives as individuals, whatever that may be, in the aggregate, they choose smaller families. Now, some women and couples will choose to have large families. We need to honor and respect that. You can't be respectful of diversity and then annoyed when people do, don't do what you do. You're kind of not, you kind of have to come to grips with that as long as they're not trying to make you do it, whatever that it is. But the fact is that in every culture, every society, every religion, every faith, if people have those choices and opportunities and options, women and couples choose smaller families. There is strong and serious research to demonstrate that we can meet at least 40% of the climate challenge just through that approach. Now, as for the other 60%, that's where renewables and conservation and a little magical thinking comes in. But that's key here, it, and it's so inexpensive. But the fact is it doesn't get the attention it needs. International family planning is woefully underfunded. The United States which invests more than any other country on Earth in international family planning, which is good, we invest $2 per American per year. We have a bold proposal to increase that all the way up to $3. <laughs> An extra dollar per American per year would transform the lives for millions and millions and millions of women around the world. 
Now, you're going to be going up, and you're going to be going up to Congress, and, and I sort of want to wrap up by telling you a couple of important, important things about Congress. It's not the most popular thing these days. Now, I'm going to give you a list of things that are more popular than Congress right now. First of all, zombies, which, you know, that, that's easy enough to understand. But, but here are four other things that are also more popular than Congress right now. According to a serious poll, hemorrhoids, toe fungus, dog poop, and cockroaches. So Congress isn't doing very well these days. And, and, and some, for, for, for some good reason. But there are some wonderful women and men there who are trying to do a great job and it's possible to make change there. The most important thing you can bring to Capitol Hill is your passion, is your commitment. The most important thing, that, that you, the message that you can leave in a very polite but very focused way is that I'm here today to tell you how I feel and what I believe, and I'll be going back home, but I'm not going away. I'm not going away. A shift of just 18 votes in the U.S. House of Representatives out of 435 would be enough to put Nancy Pelosi back in the speaker's chair where she belongs. And the last time we had, which was also the first time, we had a woman as Speaker of the House, we saw a 40% increase in international family planning funding. And I can guarantee you that if Nancy Pelosi could be speaker again, we would see incredible progress. Politics matters. Elections matter. They come down to the margin. They come down to very close calls. And one of the things we have to do, it, the one thing we have to do in addition to our passion, we have to find ways to reach across to people who maybe don't agree with us about everything to get them to see how important it is to transform people's lives, how important it is to protect the environment. And it's important, I think, to make sure that people understand that the environment isn't just this mountain 2,000 miles away. It's what goes on in people's lives. It's how their lives are going to transform. The most important thing I ever read or heard about the issue that I work on, population, is that it's not about numbers. It's about enabling every person on this earth to live a life with dignity and to have a sense that their life, whatever that life may be, has meaning and purpose. That's what this issue is about. That's the passion to bring to it. And I'm convinced that if we do that, we cannot do anything but be successful, partly because we're never going to give up. Thank you. All right, guys, you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> yellow sheet. I heard it over here. Yeah, take out your yellow sheet and <laughs> pledge to go get out the vote, right? John just told us that politics and elections matter and that you have to bring your passion and commitment to everything that you do. So bring your passion and commitment to getting out the vote, right? Pledge to get out the vote. OK. <laughs> Um, John just showed us also that empowering women can literally improve the world. And our next speaker, Sarah Craven, will build on that theme and talk to us about promoting gender equality, improving women's health, and achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health. Sarah is the chief of the Washington office of the United Nations Population Fund, a policy advocate and an attorney. Sarah is an expert in global health and human rights. Wow, good morning, good morning. Um, so happy to be here. Uh, I'm with the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA. I don't know how many of you have heard of our agency. Uh, sometimes I like to say we're the most important of the UN's voluntary agencies, and maybe when you go up to Capitol Hill, some will tell you we're the most infamous of um, the UN's agencies. Our, ma our mandate is to ensure that every pregnancy is wanted, every birth is safe, and every young person can live up to their full potential. That's great. 
great. <laughs> um, but I, I will say I have a Danish colleague who always says, UNFPA, we're the agency that makes sex boring. Uh, so, um, and I want to thank Kathy and her overview in terms of talking about the MDGs. And I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about a lot of UN um, processes. The UN, we're very much into acronyms. So I will try to tell you some of these important acronyms and why this is a very critical year uh, as we look forward to this post-MDG framework. Um, just a little anecdote, I'm moving my office, and so um, at the UN, we're a very uh, big, powerful agency. My moving crew was helping me, and that was my three children, uh, <laughs> helping me pack my boxes. And my son likes to come to work because there's a place where he really likes ice cream, and he likes to go to the Shake Shack. So he usually doesn't really pay a lot of attention to what I think, I always feel like he's, it's a drag to come to mom's office. But as we were packing and we're leaving, he goes, Mom, what, why are you leaving that poster behind? And it's a poster talking about maternal mortality. And he said, when I see that poster, I think about your office. You can't leave that poster behind. And it says on it, every minute of every day, a woman dies uh, from pregnancy. And he said, why? Why is that? Why is that, Mom? So how am I trying to explain to my mom, I mean my mom, my son, <laughs> Something he just makes no sense to him at all. That's crazy. That's completely crazy. Um, 20 years ago, when I was maybe a little bit older than some of you, uh, I had the unique opportunity to go to the Cairo Conference in um, Cairo, Egypt, the International Conference of Population and Development, the ICPD. And that's where what John was talking about, where the world came together in a very unique way. And that's when the world came together and said, no longer are we going to look at population programs from a demographic perspective or a top-down approach. We're going to look at it from a human rights perspective where women and individuals are able to freely and voluntarily determine family size and have the means to do it. And what was sort of radical about Cairo was many governments came together, but it also opened the doors to civil society as well. And that was one of the few or I would say the breakthrough when the UN really came through in a whole series of conferences in allowing civil society to be right there with governments and 179 countries coming together and endorsing what we call the Cairo consen consensus, which puts women at the center. And when, when, as John said, when women are given access to education, to economic opportunity, to political participation, and given access to um, voluntary contraception, prenatal care, reproductive health, when they are allowed to exercise their reproductive rights, they choose to have smaller families and they also have greater outcomes, not only for their families, but for their communities and for the world. So that's 20 years ago. We are now, this year, looking at the 20th anniversary of Cairo. Since Cairo, we had, as Kathy outlined for you, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, which are going to be expiring in 2015. And the Millennium Development Goal that's particularly unique to UNFPA or the one we have the biggest focus on is MDG 5, which is ending maternal mortality. Um, now, when the Millennium Development Goals were negotiated, um, as these UN processes are very difficult, family planning and reproductive health were not in there. Um, they were kind of lost, and we were put in as a sub-goal of MDG 5, which is MDG 5B. See what I'm talking about? The UN, like lots of like, uh, but 5B, which is about universal access to contraception um, and meeting the unmet need for 220 million um, women and couples who desire to have access to um, a method of family planning and currently don't have that. Um, this, uh, as I say, this year, um, we just uh, issued in February, the Secretary General issued a report, which is an overview of how far we've come in 20 years in meeting the goals of Cairo. And this is going to be, this report is what member states are going to be debating this year at the upcoming Commission on Population and Development, which is in um, the beginning of April, and then moving forward into the UN's General Assembly in September. Uh, you can get this report online. Uh, it's, I think, almost 300 pages. Uh, it it re represents a survey of going to 158 countries and doing a survey of what progress we've made in Cairo. Since Cairo, in terms of meeting Cairo's promise and its ambitious program of action, and we have made a lot of progress, but if you read the Secretary General's report, we still have so much more work to do. And the promise of Cairo, unfortunately, has not reached all, all people. It's still the most marginalized, the most vulnerable women, adolescent girls, the most poor 
have not been able to um, still, there's still 222 million who are desiring that contra access to contraception, um, the number of women who are dying in maternal death. And I think one of the issues of the report really focuses, which I'm very excited to see that there's high school students here, is because adolescent girls are still at the most risk and the most vulnerable. And I think that report shows that in almost every country of the world. Um, we often say at the UN that the most important person in the whole world is the 12-year-old girl, because the decisions and the opportunities that that 12-year-old girl faces uh, and are given can make a change not only for her, but as I say, for her whole community. Now, as a mother of an almost 11-year-old girl and a 14-year-old girl, I can also say they're the most irritating people on the planet, <laughs> but at the same time, the most important. And so meeting their, go I'm kidding, I love my daughters, they're fantastic. Um, in, in this past fall, we issued a report um, that you can get online, which was focusing on the issue of adolescent pregnancy. Um, every day, 20,000 girls below the age of 18 give birth in the developing world. And 90% of those pregnancies are within marriage, okay? So child marriage is a rampant issue. These are girls who are not freely and voluntarily going into these marriages. Um, we've been working in Ethiopia. 70% of the girls that we surveyed in a rural part of Ethiopia reported that they had their first sexual encounter within marriage um, before their first menstrual period. So these are very young girls who are, have no way to exercise their rights. They're taken out of school. They are put into these marriages, often to much older men. They're not able to negotiate um, with these older men. They're also having to deal with their mother-in-laws who are expecting them to gather the wood and gather the water. So culturally, they're always the last ones to eat. So nutritionally, they're very stunted. And then these girls get pregnant. And many of them die due to lack of a trained birth attendant. They have an obstructed labor, so there's no one there um, to help deliver them. You know, again, when I talk about the um, country of Ethiopia, which is a beautiful, vibrant country, for 77 million people in that country, they have 104 OBGYNs, okay? And of that, less than half are actually practicing beyond the uh, capital city of Addis. So the likelihood that one of those young pregnant girls is going to have a, a doctor is zero. Um, and the lucky ones are the ones that we say are the ones who have a, a maternal, um, they live, but they have a maternal morbidity such as a fistula, which creates what happens when you have an obstructed labor and the um, pressure of the baby's head after having been in labor for four or five days with no epidural. The baby is born, stillborn, and then it creates a hole or a fistula. And these young women leak urine and feces. They have no idea why this has happened to them. And they don't realize, they think this is a curse from God. They don't realize this is completely a preventable situation. So these are the, 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 the things that make my son go, why is this happening? Like, this is something that we know how to fix. This isn't something where we need a cure or we need to have a, um, you know, a silver bullet. We know what to do. It's all an issue of political will. And because these are the most marginalized, voiceless young women around the world, we haven't been able to get that political will. So this year, as I say, is critical. Um, at the CSW, which we were just talking about last week, all of these issues, 20 years later, are always the ones that are the most difficult to negotiate. Um, at the CSW, reproductive rights is still considered a, an issue that's difficult. I heard they were bracketing the word gender um, at the conference, and I can promise you when we go up at the um, Commission on Population Development in a couple weeks' time, these are also going to be contentious, and I'm sure John will address that. Um, so your voices are important on Capitol Hill. As a UN official, I can't tell you we're very you know, neutral here, so I'm not going to tell you which voices. All voices are important on Capitol Hill. But certainly in the, uh, the halls of the UN, your voices are needed as well. Um, so the CPD is coming up and through this whole year to ensure that the vision of Cairo continues in the post-millennium process. Um, I'll just close saying my son Jack this morning wanted me to go with him to buy um, soccer cleats, and I told him that I had to come talk to 700 people who might do something about those maternal mortality numbers, and he said, good luck with that, Mom. So <laughs> on behalf of Jack, I want to say thank you all for all you can do for girls and women around the world, and go for it, okay? <laughs> So we can't let her son down, people.
right? So we just talked about how we need to create political will to save women's lives and prevent maternal death, and we can create that political will, right? That what, what Sarah was talking about affects us, right? People your age, actually, not my age, right? People your age. And all we have to do is stand up and create that political will if it doesn't exist. And you can do that tomorrow during the congressional visit day. So I encourage you to come out for that. Also, again, the yellow sheet, pledge to do something about international family planning. You can make a difference. We have power. We know that we have power, and we can do this. Our next speaker. Um, is John O'Brien. He's the president of Catholics for Choice, which has for decades challenged the Catholic hierarchy on sexual and reproductive health issues and advocated for advancing access to abortion and contraception worldwide. John is a passionate advocate and leader and will speak to us on the unholy alliance, cycle beads, condom stockouts, and abstinence-only policies and programs. John. It's great to be here. I bring you greetings from all the Catholics who are for choice. Catholics from the Philippines, from Poland, from Portugal, from Peru, and from Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, the feminist majority is an incredibly important organization. And you, each and every one of you, are incredibly important. One of the things that you do is you bust stereotypes, destroy stereotypes, challenge stereotypes. And one of the stereotypes that we face is that some people say, religious extremists tell us, that faith and feminism are incompatible. I'm here to join with you today in saying that is not true. Now, I'm sure some of you do not practice a faith, are proud atheists, but I'm sure you will also agree with me that no woman, especially a woman in a developing country, should be asked to choose between her faith and her birth control, her faith and her reproductive rights. <clears throat> There's a lot of things people don't know. Um, one of the things is the inventor of the contraceptive pill was actually a Catholic. <laughs> he was a Catholic from uh, Boston, Irish Catholic descent. And it really tells us a lot about things that people don't know about Catholicism and birth control. People want to tell you, and they want you to drink the Kool-Aid. The Kool-Aid will tell you that the Catholic Church is against birth control. This is not true. The Catholic Church are all of the people in the church, the men and women, the 99% in this country who use a method of birth control that the bishops don't like. The truth is the Catholic hierarchy are against birth control and I'm not interested in forcing them to use it. <laughs> Catholic men and women all over the world we have abortions the same way as those of other faiths and no faith do. We use birth control and we make decisions for ourselves and for our families. John XXIII was a pretty important pope. And during the 1960s, he had the idea that, you know, there's this new contraceptive pill. Maybe Catholics would like to use it. So he set up a thing called the Birth Control Commission. And the job of the Birth Control Commission was to look at the ban on contraception. And the Birth Control Commission met during the 1960s. Sadly, John XXIII died, um, and Pope Paul VI took over. But he had an idea. He thought, you know something, as well as all the bishops and the cardinals and the priests who were all sitting around talking about birth control, maybe it would be a good idea to have some people who have sex actually come in and join this conversation. <laughs> so ordinary men and women joined the conversation. And this is why I'm a Catholic. I actually believe in miracles. because. <laughs> What happened was, when the bishops heard what life is like when you're afraid of intimacy, you're afraid of getting close to someone for fear that you're going to become pregnant when you cannot afford to be for your health, for your happiness. And when the bishops and cardinals heard that, you know, they judged the majority 
of people at that birth control commission said there was no impediment to changing church teaching on birth control. This is one of the best kept secrets ever. They said there was no impediment. So the idea that Catholicism and birth control are in some way incompatible is a huge lie and it's a stereotype that we need to challenge. Sadly, Pope Paul VI did not have enough faith in Catholics and he kept the minority report which kept the ban on birth control. Not that those of us who were Catholic are paying much attention to that anywhere in the world. But what does it mean for something like HIV AIDS? There are 30, 36 million people have died as a result of AIDS. But 35 million people are living with HIV. And I think that's important. Like, people who are living with HIV, they deserve to have the same health and happiness as the rest of us. The, the, idea, the idea that you could not be able to show sexual love to someone else, that's absolutely ridiculous. The idea that someone would be forced to pra practice abstinence. So those 35 million people are going to continue to have sex, and they should have the type of protection they deserve. Condoms are not a panacea to the AIDS crisis, but they can give us a lot of protection. Whether we're HIV positive or whether we don't know our status, the reality is that we know that condoms can help prevent the spread of AIDS. Anyone who's went to the AIDS conference knows AIDS is also big business. Now, the reality is groups like World Vision, groups like Caritas, the Catholic Development Agency, people like Rick Warren's Saddleback Church have become involved in the business of AIDS. They take millions of dollars of taxpayer money, that's your money, they take that to provide AIDS services. They take it from USAID, they take it from UNFPA, they take it from governments around the world. And you know something, it's not such a bad idea because sometimes faith-based agencies can provide a lot of good services. Very often they have infrastructure already there. Very often they are trusted by the local community. Um, and they have a great deal of expertise with regards to health very often. So it's not a bad idea that faith-based agencies would be able to provide HIV, AIDS, and care. It is a problem when they choose to discriminate. It is a problem when they choose not to provide the services that people actually need. And that's what we see time and time again. We see that um, people who are faith-based agencies want a free pass, and very often the governments give them a free pass. Cycle beads. I don't know how many of you are using cycle beads at the moment, but I have a funny feeling that they don't work for everybody. In fact, um, when I met in places like Uganda and Kenya, and I ask women who are Catholic, do you use cycle beads? They say, why would I be using cycle beads? I want access to more effective contraception than that. If you choose to use cycle beads, I think that's wonderful. But I think this part of the problem is that people like AID, who have cycle beads as part of their um, purchasing, um, very often it's presumed that people who are Catholic want to use a less effective method of contraception because the hierarchy in our church don't allow us or say we can't use a more effective method. The reality is we do. Cycle beads are they're pieces of uh, beads on a string which you use to count the standard method days. So you use for natural family planning. I think that that can work very, very well if you have a regular cycle um, and your diet is wonderful and you don't live in a developed part, developing part of the world. But for many people, cycle beads just don't work. And it shouldn't be presumed that Catholics should have to use cycle beads. Catholics and non-Catholics, women should have the full range of options so the woman can actually make the decision to choose. We've heard a lot of talk in recent days about religious freedom. Um, just this week, the Supreme Court, court um, heard the Hobby Lobby case, where a Catholic business owner um, is appealing to the court 
um, to um, prevent um, his um, employees having the right to um, no-cost contraception under the Affordable Care Act. This is part of a overall program by religious extremists to deny um, contraception, to deny reproductive health to people. It is nothing more than that and nothing less than that. What's going on is just the tip of the iceberg with the Affordable Care Act and contraception. What this is about is that religious extremists have failed to convince people of faith when they in the pews, they failed to convince us not to use contraception. So what they're seeking to do is through the courts to impose their will on people of faith and those of no faith because the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, when they want to take birth control out of the Affordable Care Act, that's not just something that affects Catholics, that is something that would affect every single American. There is something profoundly wrong when those religious extremists seek to impose their will on others. Constitutionally, what we believe in is freedom of religion. You can't have freedom of religion unless you have freedom from religion. I hope you at the Feminist Majority Foundation, when you go to Congress, I hope that when you go to CPD up at the United Nations, I hope you remind people that people of faith deserve the same services as everyone else does. We should not be discriminated against. We should not, it should not be presumed that a woman living in northern Kenya has to use cycle beads. We should be able to have access to condoms to prevent the spread of HIV and we should be able to have birth control under the Affordable Care Act. It's only as a result of standing up to religious extremists that those of us of faith and those who choose not to practice a faith can have our freedoms. Thank you very much. I had to interrupt there because I saw people looking at their phones. What in the world are the cycle beads, right? <laughs> um, and you know what? And I think that that shows a, a, a very important point, right? This isn't contraception that you would accept for yourself, right? It's not acceptable for anyone else to be forced to use this type of contraception either. Um, so I want to say thank you. What? Oh. Okay, how should I do it? Okay, Please, don't leave, okay. So there's been a program change, so don't leave, stay where you are, but I want you to thank all of our panelists for being here today with us. I know y'all are really excited to get to the workshops, but first we have our wonderful regional caucuses. All of your regional organizers are up here and we're so excited to talk to you about what's happening in your state, what's happening on your campus, and what's happening in your entire region. So please come. I'm Maddie Barnett, the Midwest organizer, and we will be in Van Buren. So if you're a Midwesterner out there, please come see me in Van Buren after this. 
everyone. I'm Christy. I am the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast Campus Organizer. If you have any questions about what regional caucus you're in, it's in our program. So definitely check it out. It'll be a great space for you to meet all of each other and to meet us and talk about everything going on in your schools. So. Hi, everybody. My name is Edweth. I'm the Southern Region Campus Organizer. Anybody from the South in here? <laughs> Woo! Get excited. I'm going to see all of you lovely people in the Jackson Room. Check it out. Can't wait to see all of you. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. If you're a high school student, we're meeting in Wilson to learn more about Girls Learn. Talk to high school students. Yay. OK. And all you wild and crazy Western folks, we're in, we're in which one? Which one? Sorry. Madison. Madison. Madison for the Wild West. Madison. Woohoo! 